Welcome to the Julie Salant Podcast, the place to reconnect to your heart and live your soul purpose. This is where you will find inspiring information on how to reconnect to your heart, get into mind, body, spirit alignment, and step into your personal power. Together, we will hear messages from the sacred animal kingdom, discuss how to reframe success that works best for you, and learn to step into divine flow, allowing you to do what your soul came here to do. Thank you for being here. And now, Let's tune in to today's show. Hey, everyone. It's Julie Salant. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the podcast today. I have an amazing guest. His name is Will Mann. He is a crop consultant. I've been talking with Will a couple couple of months now, and we have had some seriously awesome discussions about crops, about agriculture, about how the consumers view what you're actually picking up at the supermarket and farmers. And we are excited today to talk to you about all things crop and agriculture and Will's just, he's one of those people who has a wealth of knowledge and I'm super fortunate to have him with us today. Thank you so much for being here, Will. I'm super happy that you're able to come to the podcast. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for your time today. Uh, folks, again, my name is Will Mann. I'm from Northeastern North Carolina. Uh, for the last 25 years, uh, my career has been in agriculture, starting out in, in private sales and about 20 years of it was with our local soil and water district and, and now as a private crop consultant. Um, in our county, we grow every commodity in, that's grown in North Carolina aside from Christmas trees. We, we're very diversified. We're land-based. We're the third largest county in the state. We have about 733 square miles and about 110,000 acres of cropland. Uh, we're in the coastal plain area that, um, for, for the most part. Um, and my interest in agriculture is, is very diverse. Um, I've had wore a lot of hats, uh, as I've already described and have had an interest in how agriculture needs to improve and what improvements we've already made. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work in a county that has always been very innovative uh, in Southeastern agriculture. And what I mean by innovation is looking at opportunities to improve soils um, from an agronomic standpoint and, and also an ecological standpoint. Um, one of the things that we were faced with in the mid 1980s was the 1985 Farm Bill. And for those that aren't familiar with that, that was a landmark farm bill. And, and what it meant uh, by being landmark, it set a precedence that farmers had to follow criteria as far as soil erosion in order to participate in federal programs that are for farmers and to be able to sell their commodities at, at, um, at a price. Well, what that enforced farmers to do is look, be a lot more environmentally friendly and look at better soil improvement practices to reduce soil erosion and also to improve water quality. Uh, North Carolina in the last 20 years has been very proactive in, in looking at water quality issues as far as nutrient loading in our, in our streams and estuaries. About 65% of our cropland is, is in an estuary that we monitor not only nitrogen loading, but phosphorus loading as well. So we're gaining a better understanding all the time about agronomic practices as far as fertilization application, any animal waste, uh, and also how we're managing our animals and our crops as well. We're, uh, we're looking at better diversities and, and that sort of thing as far as weed control, nutrient management, stuff like that. Um, you know, as, as we move forward in soil improvements, we're basically taking a step back before we can make a step forward. And what I mean by that is a lot of the practices we're starting to implement in, in large scale agriculture as far as improving our soils ecologically, because we've got to remember there's a diversity of wildlife and animal systems that live in our soils, just like what we can see with our natural eye. Much of that in a soil is a microscopic in, in nature, but it's just as diverse and just as important to us. 
So, you know, if we're going to preserve animals that we can see in rangeland or, or, or in the rainforest somewhere on the globe, we've got to start to preserve that biological structure that's in the soil as well, because whatever we do from a chemistry standpoint, as far as a fertilizer application or something like that, all that is possible because of the biological structures that are in that soil. Um, you know, We've depleted a lot of our soils through poor farming practices in the past. But going back to my emphasis on that 1985 farm bill, that's where we started to make a major turn and made a turn in, in, in agriculture in, in the continental United States. Um, we started looking at some of this. And, and of course, the organic farming movement that became very popular in the late 60s has, has really escalated and, and mushroomed out uh, in production agriculture. And even those that are growing large scale traditional commodities like your corn, wheat and soybeans, they're starting to look at some of that organic emphasis. Um, and even if they may still be using some chemistry as far as a synthetic fertilizer or maybe even pesticides, we're starting to look at some of the uh, biological structures as well um, because all that's very important. Um, so we're, we're looking at the biological, and, and if we look at soils, we basically got a mineral component that has um, uh, made of geology. You know, it could be a sand, silt, or clay, or a combination of those. Then we've got the biological structure, which is all these bugs and spiders, bacteria, fungi, all those things that are beneficial to us. And even the larger stuff that we may see with our naked eyes, such as a spider or earthworm or something like that, all that's important. And then the thirdly is, is the chemistry that we've studied quite a bit as far as uh, what is needed from an elemental standpoint, nitrogen, the, the macros such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and on down to micro, micronutrients as well. So we've got a complex thing, and, and why this is important to us, number one, we can't have agriculture without soils. Yes, there is some techniques where we can grow in hydroponically and greenhouses and that sort of thing, and there's a specific emphasis on that. But what I'm going to talk about today is what we're, how we're managing our real estate, so to speak, here in the United States. What are we doing with our soils? And, and that's where my emphasis has been in. I've had an opportunity to work with some greenhouse growers and stuff like that, but the most of my stuff has been a, in a traditional farming method. Um, you know, we agriculture is a, is a large land user, but we're a small percentage of that uh, population. You know, there's a, a figure thrown around that about 2% of, of the uh, workforce in the United States is involved in agriculture. Well, that may be so, that's 2% of the production ag, but we've got a large percentage that's involved in the process, distribution, and even marketing. So, agri and of course, we all eat, we all consume vegetables, fruits, and nuts, whatever, grains, uh, produce, uh, you know, our, our meat sources, all these things. So all of it impacts us. So if we start with our basis at soils, and, and this is what I'm basically going to talk a lot about on today is understanding why our soils are so important to us. Um, you know, and, and why we have been so innovative here in, in our county is we're, we're looking at the ecological. We're, we're, again, we're stepping back to go forward. We're looking at practices that were implemented before the chemical revolu revolution of the early 20th century. Before synthetic fertilizers came on board, we were using every well everyone was using what we term organic practices today whether we're using animal waste we may be using cover crops and a cover crop is a crop that's grown on farmland or cropland that is not harvested it's grown from a purpose standpoint as a food so source for for our souls well when we look at it actually it's a food source for our biological structure because if we look at our our, our souls uh, and, and our plants, 60% of that sugar that's manufactured through photosynthesis is actually translocated through the plants to feed the roots, which actually feeds the biological structure in the soil. And that's it. that biological structure really lives in the top six inches of our soil surface. That's what we call the rhizosphere. And, and this is where all the action takes place. This is, this is where wild kingdom is in the soil.
And basically what that biological structure does, it goes out and gets the mineral nutrients that the plant needs and, and breaks it down. So in exchange for that sugar from photosynthesis, which is primarily, primarily glucose, and it could be some fructose as well. But anyway, the biological structure gets that, sh that sugar and exchanges or, or maybe processes that mineral component and feeds it to the plant. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. This is all very important to us. So we, we've got to do this. And, you know, I, I'm not against pesticides, you know, um, but I think that, that all farmers now are starting to use pesticides correctly. Well, when we use a pesticide and even some synthetic fertilizer, it has a large impact on this biological structure. Farmers are starting to look at this. Of course, ecologists and scientists and biologists have, have told us about this for so many years. So we're starting to look at it. You know, if we all look at agriculture, one of the most important things is there's not a lot of room econ economically. Um, probably if we looked at any industry and compared agriculture to it, you have the smallest return on your investment in agriculture of any industry out there. Um, Let's so, talk about that. Let me get, interrupt you for one second, because I know you can talk a lot about soil, but I want to ask you a question because this, sure. this, this will rope into it first for all of us that are the consumers, because I'm going to, I'm not, I shouldn't assume because you know what happens when you assume, but I'll just use myself as an example. I don't know a lot about this and Will does. So every time he stock talks about it, I'm always like, wow, I didn't know that. So you probably just got a lot of information on the soil, which is amazing and super important. And so I would like to bring in, let's talk about the pandemic, what we've been through. And when I go to the supermarket, and I know we've talked about this, Will, and I see two different types of lettuce, right? Keep it simple and basic. And one's grown in North Carolina and one could be organic, right? From Honduras or something. Can you, how are they actually grown the same through the same soil, just in different places? And why am I paying more, $2 more for something that's the same, that looks the same except for different packaging? I know I just okay. threw you a, a big one, but. <laughs> no, 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 and, and, and that's, that's a question I've heard from a lot of people. Um, you know, if we, let's, let's talk about what organic is. When, for a farmer to grow an organic product, Number one, he has to go through a certification process. That's here in the United States. What okay. that certification process means is, uh, and we've got quite a few organic producers here in North Carolina. I've been very fortunate to work with many of them. Typically, it's a three-year process. And that during that three-year process, a farmer cannot use any synthetic fertilizer or synthetic pesticides on his farm. Oh, and there's documentation that has to be filled out as well as reviewed by a certified or a technical person every year annually. Cool. So, so that's step one. The next thing is when, when that pr produce is, is grown in a cert certified organic field, he, that farmer has to keep track of what is actually put in there. So it may be an uh, organic fertilizer product. And there are some organic uh, pest control methods. We're not going to call them pesticides because they're not. Uh, they're, they're just different. Uh, they, they could be certain types of traps. It could be certain types of preventive oils, natural oils that could be out there. there there's different ways about that. There could be host plants, uh, of which a host plant would be a plant that's grown just to, to host beneficial insects out there, it could be plants to attract pollinators out there. So that, that is some of the technical aspects on what an organic farm looks like or how it's grown. That's kind of the short of it. That's really the cliff notes, if you want to call it that. Uh, I won't get too technical on it. So, that's, so that farmer has got to be certified. He's got to follow certain criteria and certain practices to grow it organic. Now, Farmers in the continental United States or anywhere in the United States have certain criteria to grow produce, whether they are organic or just a commercial, even a commercial farmer that may be used synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. If he applies a pesticide based on label rate, 
uh, every pesticide in the United States has to go through a registration process with the EPA. And in that registration process on a pesticide, when it's marketed, it has a user's guide or a, a de um, direction guide. And many of your pesticides that are labeled for produce, for example, it tells you that this product cannot be applied X number of hours before harvest. So that producer has to recognize that. The other thing is whether it's organic or one that's commercially grown with synthetic inputs, it all is graded by the US Department of Agriculture. There's a, a standards uh, that any produce has to go through. All right, now, if we import a produce from another country, we don't know exactly what criteria that country has as far as what that farmer can use, how often he can use it, that sort of thing. We just don't know. We have an idea, but we don't know. Now, when that produce comes in, it has to go through that USDA grading portion. So they have to, it is graded all the same. Now, if it's organic from another country, we don't, we have, again, a slight understanding, but we don't know exactly what their organic standards are because they're not like the United States. That's the thing about it. A lot of the standards that we have in the United States are not the same standards they have in other countries. Now, the inspection of them is the same, but as far as the growth of it is not. Now, if is something that grown in the soils in a foreign country as nutritious as, as what's grown in our country, that's very interesting. There's a couple of ways of looking at it. If, for example, if that produce is grown in a country that has volcanic soils, for example, mm -hmm. volcanic soils by nature have a much more tremendously mineralogy, meaning a much more diverse nutrient or mineral makeup. So essentially, that vegetable that's grown on a volcanic soils has a higher nutrient density than soils that's maybe grown here in the continental United States that's not volcanic. We don't have a lot of volcanic soils in the continental U.S. And, you know, we've got quite a bit, obviously, in Hawaii, mm -hmm. for example. So nutrient density, I think, is our biggest question. Now, is there a way of measuring that outside of a laboratory? No. There's, there's some prototypes and some ideas and, and different things that's coming about. Um, that, that may be consumer available where well, we can measure it. But, you know, organic is important to a lot of people. And I can certainly understand that. It's, it's like a humanitarian treatment of animals. Right. You know, people, people feel comfortable with that. And I understand that. But most importantly, let's understand about nutrient density. Because if we had, say, organic produce that was grown here in North Carolina versus one that was grown by synthetic, if we look at the nutrient density count components that this grown with synthetic inputs here in North Carolina may be more nutritious than that that's grown with organic. Because here, you know, the the chemistry makeup of an organic production may not be as is the uh, nutrient dense as, as a synthetic. And what I mean by that, animal manures are not all the same. And and really and truly, that's kind of the cornerstone of an organic production as far as nutrient wise. Now, there's some other products that are made from fish waste. Uh, there's some great products made from seaweed and kelp. Uh, and then of course you've got the cover crops that people use uh, for green manuring like we've been using for centuries here in the US. Uh, you know, all that is great. And, and I'm a very firm um, proponent of that. I'm an advocate on those because I've got some commercial guys that use it and they're very effective. But when we look at, at what a synthetic can, as far as loading up those nutrients and improving the, the vitality of plants and the availability of certain nutrients, it, it may be a benefit. Um, can, can organic production outpace synthetic? We don't know. And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, if because we've got the genetically modified organisms, the GMOs, I was one of the first salesmen in North Carolina to sell a GMO soybeans in the mid, uh, in the mid 1990s. Um, I was a proponent of them. I won't give my um, my personal input on them now, but I do know that there's some 
interesting literature out there that's saying that a GMO does not behave in that co cohesion relationship with biological structures like we mentioned earlier about the sugar exchange with nutrients. There's some research out there, sadly it's not from here in the U.S., it's outside, uh, that's saying that GMOs don't react the same with biological structures as, as a non-GMO crop. So, so as widely used and widely accepted as, as some GMOs are, we don't know exactly is, is the nutrient density there or not. Uh, and, and of course, it could be the environment. You know, soils across the U.S. are different. Rainfall plays into a big point of, of it. You know, heat units and, and, and the growing degree days, all those are big, big ideas and, and, and that. I think our biggest thing from a consumer standpoint is understanding that nutrient density in our crops moving forward. Um, you know, and, and so the reason why I wanted to talk with you today and share some of this, there's great material out there in social media and on the internet from a farmer standpoint. I really hope that we, as those in production agriculture like myself, that work with farmers, that work with the ag industry, I really want to give an open door policy to start to understand what consumer concerns are mm -hmm. because we, we want their input. We want their information because without them, we wouldn't be in business. You know, we're, we in agriculture are faced with a lot of imported goods from other countries um, because they can just grow it so much cheaper. Their labor standards are not as well as ours. Their pay rates are not as well as ours. And they don't have the environmental uh, rules and regulations. Now, I'm not saying that what we got, all these regulations are wrong or bad, I, and, and certainly not, because we've all got to do our part. We've all got to look out after the ones that work for us and, and take care of our agricultural system. But it's, it's not a level playing field from a producer standpoint right now. Mm. So we, we want to try to, number one, like any industry, we want to try to gain that consumer loyalty. Number two, we want to try to gain consumer um, security, their, their, their interest in it, their confident, confidence in that they're getting a good product. I'm a, I'm a very pro big proponent on uh, country of origin labeling. There's been a lot of conflict on that, especially in the meat industry for the last close to 20 years now. Yep. You know, some, some are saying the expense of it and all. But, you know, if it's an investment in that we can secure consumer loyalty and buying a U.S. produced good versus an imported good, I think it would not be an expense, but yet an investment. You know, we because we want that person that's at the grocery counter that may be looking at a, a certain cut of beef or, or looking at uh, some lettuce or cucumbers, we want them to understand where it's grown. You know, better yet, I'd like to see it that the states, because North Carolina, is, as well as many states, have, have gotten slogans or, or branding that's attached to certain products that are manufactured here. Now, not necessarily a raw good, such as fresh produce or beef, but some of the produce goods like cornmeal flour, that sort of thing, or maybe certain barbecue sauces or something may have our state's logo on it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really feel like that that's certainly something we need to look at as far as, far as country of origin labeling. The, the other thing is, you know, we in production ag, we don't want to be the bad guys. You know, there's certain streams of media that has made us out to be uh, just a minute group of people that are destroying the environment and ignorant to different things. Listen, if we don't protect the environment, we'll be out of business. I mean, just that simple. Because the again, the, the economic elbow room, we don't have it. So we can't trip up and make a mistake financially. And we've got to protect the environment. You know, we're, we're raising livestock and animals and stuff like that. You know, and, and we look at produce, for example. Those produce guys will tell you how beneficial uh, pollinator insects are to them. You know, mm -hmm. if we don't have pollinator insects, we we don't have specific types of fruits and vegetables. I won't go into them because there's so many of them. But we've got to do this. We've got to protect the environment. We've got to have a better understanding. And I tell you, there's a lot of ag meetings I go to before COVID 
that there were a lot of entomologists in the room because educating on us on this. Wow, wow. Now, I, talking about the pandemic and what that means, I, there was a lot of fear and a lot of mistrust about availability of fruits and vegetables and meats and stuff like that in the grocery store. Yep, yep. I can't speak on every part of the supply chain out there because I don't know what happened. But I do know this. From a producer standpoint, I can look outside my window and visit my town and my community. We didn't run short of anything. It was kind of business as usual for everybody. We don't have a lack of food. Now, there there will always be areas of the country that are facing droughts. Specific areas of the southwestern United States are being faced with a drought right now. Um, some mm -hmm. farmer friends and I were talking about it because all we can hear is or know about is what, what is given to us by news. Because mm -hmm. I don't I don't have a lot of personal connections out there. But we certainly pray for those people. And we're thankful that we're part of the same industry that they are. And we're able to do what we can. And, and I've been a big proponent of the livestock industry. I've been a part of the Cattlemen's Association here locally for a lot of years. And I know over the years we've sent materials and supplies to, to areas that may be devastated by storms or droughts and that sort of thing. So we've got to be faced with that. Um, and they'll always be here. But we've got an ag system in place in this country that is set up for that. Yes, we may have to import stuff to make up for the difference, but we don't have a shortage of that. One thing that I will say from my standpoint on a pandemic, I hope that those that are in the production end of it and the process and the distribution and manufacturing it's been a wake-up call for everybody. I don't care if you're in agriculture or building cars. I, it was something no one had ever been faced with. Right. Uh, it's been, what, over 100 years since the influenza. But, you know, and I don't think it was as widely spread as, as what we saw with, with COVID. And certainly the U.S. lifestyle had changed quite a bit in the last 100 years. A lot of us had moved away from farms, and a lot of us don't understand where agriculture comes from, that sort of thing. But I certainly don't want people to be fearful. There's people that are working 24-7 every day to make sure we've got food. Again, it's our business. You know, I, I can't go to a major metropolitan area and tell someone how to run their job. And it's some, certainly something that I've been assigned with to be a part of agriculture. I've been certainly blessed to be a part of an industry, to, to serve so many people, uh, and, and to be given a skill set as well as gaining a skill set every day. Um, agriculture, though it's, it's the world's oldest profession, it's certainly we're learning every day. It's a, it's a learning tool. You know, um, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you my formal education is not in agriculture, it's in business. But I've spent the last 20 plus years in studying what, I, what, what it takes to be good in agriculture. Uh, farmers are one that are always willing to share most of their trade secrets, and, and we have been able to do a whole lot. That's probably the biggest thing on, on our end that the pandemic has, has done. We don't have the field days and exchange of information. Uh, fortunately, I've been a part of a lot of Zoom calls. I've presented on quite a few. Uh, so, so we're doing what we can to exchange information and what's going on. Um, the biggest thing is we can present to ourselves all day long in our social circles, if you want to call it, that, or our industry circles. But I certainly want to see the consumers get involved. Um, one of the things that we've seen with the pandemic movement, there's a lot of focus now on small scale agriculture, uh, community based gardens and that sort of thing. I, I think that's great. You know, a lot of people show some resistance to it. Hey, I think it's great. I think we're also seeing here in the United States a great growing uh, percentage of those in agriculture that don't have an agricultural background. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they may, I see a lot of ex-military come into it, and I, I congratulate those people, and I'm thankful for them. We're seeing a lot of uh, different uh, ethnic groups moving to different parts of the country that are bringing in agriculture. Uh, or, or their own take of agriculture. And we're also seeing a lot of uh, gender roles, uh, females taking the lead in agriculture. And I think that's great because all these people are bringing new ideas and new understandings to the table. 
because here's the thing, we can only see what we know for so long, but when we've got a new mindset, a new set of eyes on, on it, we welcome that. Now, the thing that concerns those of us in the traditional roles in agriculture, and, and this is the thing we were concerned with, with this influx of small agriculture was that our urban counterparts, again, had we, we've got the thought process that, again, they think that we're just big agriculture and we spray everything and just try to decimate the environment. But we've seen that those that don't have a traditional role in ag are understanding some of the hardships that we go through um, as far as facing weather or pest or, or you know, disease, that sort of thing, uh, livestock issues, that, that sort of thing. So, you know, if anything, I'm, I'm glad that they're here, that they're getting a better understanding. Um, you know, we... We need to know what they, the consumer standpoints are as well. What, what is it that you're faced with? What, what are you concerned about your food supply? Mm -hmm. Because like, like them, the only thing that we have in this is an exchange of media. Now, I'm not saying that that's wrong, or I'm not saying it's a misinformed information system in the media, but I think that having that face-to-face -face conversation or a Zoom call or whatever it may be, or, or an exchange of an email or a telephone call, all that is beneficial. Um, you know, and there's a lot of great information with social media platforms, and I, and I don't want to rule that out. Um, I, I'm, I applaud agriculture because the our largest percentage of our agriculture are 50 plus years old. So it took them a long time to grasp social media and the value in it. But we're, I tell you, it's amazing to me, the age group that has embraced social media and starting to use it. And of course, the, the young people, as well as those with non-traditional uh, ag backgrounds have embraced it for, since, it, since its inception. And, and I'm glad that that's here. So, so that exchange of information is, is going to be key moving forward. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast. This is Julie Salant. If you like what you've heard and you'd like to go deeper, there are two ways that you can work with me to get personal one-on-one -on -one coaching or to receive an animal reading. Click on the link below to set up a time with me to talk. You can also check out the Spiritual Cafe. That is a membership-based group that I have with a dear friend of mine where we talk live monthly and give you information on elevated consciousness answer your questions and help you move through life with clarity and conscious decisions. Looking forward to talking with you soon. Thanks, Julie.